So I'm going to introduce now uh, Bill Horberg. And Bill, you want to say hi? Hi. hi. Thanks, Mira, for hosting this uh, webinar. And uh, for everybody out there, I hope you're safe and well and uh, glad to share a little bit of time with you. Thank you, Bill. And da David, um, David is, uh, Bill is the producer of Lars and the Real Girl, and David Torn is the composer. David, you want to say a quick hi? Yeah, hey. Um, <laughs> yep. I <laughs> echo everything that Bill said, including uh, it's nice to know that hopefully that everybody who's online is safe. So. Um, yes, definitely. We hope that everybody is. Um, safe, healthy, taking good care of themselves, washing their hands, practicing social distancing, and um, that we'll get to see you in person when all of this is over. So um, I was telling Bill and David earlier that I remember that back in 2007, we, the, the Woodstock Film Festival showed Lars and the Real Girl, and um, Bill, I remembered the reason why we replaced <laughs> Um, marriage life with Lars and the Real Girl was because both of them had uh, Patricia Clarkson in uh, them and she was already confirmed to come. So that's why I told um, um, the late Bingham Ray, help me, help me. And he, and he got us um, Lars and the Real Girl. And I believe it was either opening or closing night film and people loved it. So yeah, we um, were in love with Patricia Clarkson and looking for opportunities to put her in anything uh, we were making at the time. I, I was running uh, Sidney Kimmel's production company, and he was the producer and financier of Lars and the Real Girl. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Sarah Aubrey and John Cameron, who were the producers. I was an executive producer uh, on the movie and you know, work closely with them and with, of course, Craig Gillespie, the director. Right. So um, before I open the Q&A to our attendees, I just have a couple of questions for you. Um, so, Bill, you came into this project, Lars and the Real Girl, with the director already attached. Um, I don't know if there was any cast already in place at the time. Can you tell a little bit about when you first received, when the first the project came to into your hands, um, what were some of the first things that you did after reading the script and um, reacting to it? Well, I joined Sidney Kimmel's company in uh, the summer in 2005. Uh, and I, you know, had a pile of screenplays I was working my way through. Uh, trying to put together a slate of independent films for us to make. Uh, and this was a script that just jumped out of the pile and grabbed me by the throat. It was one of the most original pieces of writing that I had come across. Nancy Oliver uh, was the writer of the script. Uh, she was actually nominated for an Academy Award uh, for original screenplay for her script for Lars. And, um, you know, I was inquiring after it. There were a couple other companies circling around it already. Uh, Warner Brothers had their own independent film arm at that time, and they were having some conversations about making it. Uh, but we moved very aggressively and met with the producers, uh, met with Craig Gillespie, the director. Uh, he had already approached Ryan Gosling, uh, which was music to my ears. I mean, a huge fan. And, um, you know, the prospect of making a movie with Ryan was exactly the kind of profile of project that we were hoping to get in business on. So we were very quick, quick to uh, say, let's all make this uh, and made an aggressive uh, offer, uh, got the rights to the project. Uh, I remember, I think, probably because of Ryan's availability or maybe Craig was finishing another film, that uh, we couldn't go into production right away. So we ended up making this in 2006, and it came out in uh, 2007. Okay, I mean, I do have somebody here, uh, an anonymous attendee who is asking, how was it to, uh, to work with uh, Ryan Gosling? Is there anything else that you want to embellish upon talking about? 
no experience with him? Yeah, he's an amazing, very lifelike dolls who are often uh, companions to people who were uh, coming back, you know, from military duty uh, and dealing with different PTSD issues. So, you know, I think he really dug deep uh, finding the character. He also, after we made the movie, I didn't know this at the time, uh, told me he was a big Gene Wilder fan and that he had spent a lot of time looking at different uh, Gene Wilder performances and, you know, finding that uh, knife edge. I think this whole movie was such a tightrope act and it could have fallen off uh, very easily, you know, given what a heightened premise the story had. Uh, and he just walked that uh, tightrope beautifully. Um, I'd say the one thing about him, he, he's kind of a my way or the highway guy. And he did show up uh, right before shooting with that a very char uh, characteristic Lars mustache, uh, which nobody had known about and, you know, we weren't particularly prepared for. And there was quite a bit of discussion uh, about whether we wanted to make the film with a mustache protagonist. And he just said, Bill, uh, this is Lars. You know, I, if I had to change this about myself, I really couldn't play the role. I couldn't play the character. And uh, I would go home. So that was the end of that meeting and that discussion. Uh, I, be before I move on to other questions, I, I just want to um, extend on that a little bit because you were talking about how Ryan Gosling was sort of like st walking a fine line as he was uh, carving that particular role or entering into that persona. Um, that reminds me a little bit of when you talked about audiences, um, really uh, sort of different reactions that came from audiences sitting together in the same theater. Can you share that with our um, attendees a little bit? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, as a rule, the genre that I'm most attracted to is uh, the genre of something new. And uh, I really had never read anything quite like this. And on the page, and I think very intentionally as Craig made the movie, it was a movie whose tone was very, very uh, ambiguous. Uh, and I think more than any other movie I've ever worked on, you know, I've made comedies that had pathos and I've made dramas that had, you know, jokes or, or laughs in them. And of course you always want uh, both, but this movie was just balanced on the head of a needle as, uh, you know, perfectly equalized between uh, comedy and drama to the degree that when we, you know, edited the movie and started screening it for audiences, it was a kind of wild, uh, raucous affair because you had people for whom this movie was one of the funniest things they'd ever seen and they were just laughing hysterically uh, at the comedy inherent in this premise, and other people who were deeply, deeply moved by a story of a you know, delusional man and a community that comes together and participates in a social way in his healing process. And uh, literally when the funeral of Bianca was happening, you know, there were people who were just cracking up and people right next to them in tears who were angry and going, you know, shut up, this isn't funny, this is, you know, sad. Uh, and so uh, it, it was uh, tricky, you know, in terms of how do we market it? And, you know, uh, there's something about the premise of a guy who gets a blow up doll that seems like it's gonna be a kind of bad taste, um, you know, maybe weakened at Bernie's style you know, very uh, broad comedy. Uh, and this was very far from being that. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, you know, it found the audience who enjoyed it uh, for what it was. Thank you. That was, so, that was really great. I have actually a question now for, for David. This is from uh, 
Nate Potker, and he's asking uh, you, David, he's wondering about your instrumental palette choices and were you given guidance or did you just follow your gut? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, what was the, right before you said, did you just follow your gut? What was the question? Uh, um, the, 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 he, Nate is ask, wondering about your instrumental palette choices. Were yes. you given guidance or did you follow your gut? Um, interesting. Um, there, there was some guidance, but it was um, it, it, in the beginning, it came from looking at what was actually in the temp score, which was difficult because it was all very, very good wasn't quite glued together, but, you know, it was tempted with people I know and respect. It was tempted with uh, my friend Carter Burwell. I think it was even a piece or two that I played on. Um, there was a, a John Bryan piece. There was a piece by Michael Dana. And everything had something in it that made sense to me. And, and, and one of, the, one of the, the clues that you get when you're writing a score and you have no idea where to start because there isn't quite a clear direction beyond the temp score is that you start, I start coming up with sound palette in my head first, start thinking about it first. What do I like from this? What do I like from this? And, and I can do that very quickly, go through the things I don't want to try and then go through the things that I want to try. I thought really seriously about making sure that a clarinet was somehow featured in there. I knew that I was going to use, um, um, one of those little home keyboards that uh, you you touch. It's not it's not a Celeste. It's a I forget what it's called. Uh, it's it's just like a Celeste. It's like the the 1960s version. I knew that that was going to be in the palette. I knew that some ambient things from the guitar were going to be in the palette. I kind of knew that some normal guitar would be in the palette, but not necessarily featured. And uh, and then I took my cue by writing those first couple of pieces that you write for the director and the producers that come to the first music meeting after having, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, after having um, uh, some kind of a spotting session, um, looking at each cue in the film and getting an idea of what might ne be needed just from talking about it with the producer and a director, then go in, find out what works, and then get feedback from the director, the producer, the music editor, uh, and the film editor find out. And, and you kind of like, this was a hard one because I knew that it was really different than, it had to be very different than anything I had done before. I knew that it had to feel somehow song-based, but it took me quite a while to get from where I started, which was good and stayed in the film, and then get to that place where we had things that were like, um, almost like sea shanties um in some way that was a huge revelation for me was was that 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 uh, descending guitar figure which is actually played on piano um that's kind of a sea shanty in in a six eight kind of feel um and uh, that first that first meeting with everybody playing the demos which one of the demos actually uh, of the three demos that I played off picture, just inspired by what I was seeing in the story, two of the demos became two of the most important cues in the film. So um, I ended up with a palette that included three pianos, small band with um, uh, an upright bass player who was also playing in the string group, um, um, and some guitars and ambience and uh, and, uh, and and it kind of and and those that instrument that I can't remember the name of and Celeste I added Celeste uh, on the stage uh, so that was the palette and I think that it worked really well. Bill was talking about the, the fine lines in this film about a story coming across that you don't really nothing is really being told to you. You have to pull from it what you interpret about the story. Is this a story about a very, uh, uh, is, it, is he ill? Does he have some kind of other difference, mental difference that we don't know about? Um, is it funny that she's a, a doll? Is it funny that they, that the community, 
you know, first you got to get past the critics. Is it believable that the whole community backs them up? Well, of course it's not, but you know, um, but it, it, the, the, that fine line that Bill was talking about trying to do something that my goal was to warm to the character and let humor be in the music, but also leave enough space that I could make kind of, um, um, I don't know, like um, environmental commentary that this is open, that the story is open to you, that you are making the decision, and I am not really gonna fucking tell you what to, what to feel. Um, and that was super important to me. And uh, when I mean, talked David, about- David, I remember uh, yeah. apropos of that, you know, the, the, the only real arm wrestle I had with Craig on the film was kind of about spotting and how much music would be in the film. You know, it was so spare in the first go around with him where he just said I don't want the music to kind of tip the hand one way or the other and yes, so a you lot know, of these scenes were really dry and I kept saying okay but you know we can find a musical voice that isn't leaning hard one way or another and I don't remember but I think we got them from like 12 or 15 minutes of music up to 28 minutes 27 or, or 28 but but in yeah. fact and 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 you, you bring up a point that was critical to the sound especially when you made the meetings uh, that was a big change in the in the in in craig's approach to me changed when you were in those meetings and and sometimes when sarah was in a meeting too but um um my idea was was actually this is a little strange but was wetness a feeling of like you know meat space you know <laughs> wetness something that isn't dry it's not droll it could be gone the wrong way it could become super fucking corny which i didn't want at all um but but i knew that i was i was riding that line i i knew that the kinds of melodies that i was looking at except for little twists chromatic twists in some of the the melodic things you know it's and some of the ambient things and the spaciousness of it, it was, it was driving a fine line. And I lost uh, the, one of the, argu the, big, the only argument I really could not get past Craig was there was a spot in the film where I noticed everybody, including myself, becoming really uncomfortable, a, a little too uncomfortable with the film, that, that I began to question the uh, lack of uh, um, uh, the, um, the request uh, to please believe that this could all be true moment. And I noticed a few times in audience uh, meetings that, that other people were in this, that a lot of guys in the audience would be like shuffling their feet and, you know, very strange, but true for me. And I really wanted to put music there. It was about another four minutes of music and he, and, and I had it and I knew what it was and he just wouldn't hear it. Yeah. Did not want to, yeah. didn't want to hear it. I, again, I, it, I'm going to go off that, the fine line thing for, for Nate, which is one of the hardest things in the film, one of the hardest things I wrote, and I think one of the most successful things that I wrote for myself in the film was the funeral. Because what do you do? We knew it needed music. We knew I didn't, we wouldn't, didn't want to do, uh, uh, you know, hang with the church organ corn we knew that it had to relate to the rest of the score and there was i could not find any rhythm for that entire piece that wasn't that wasn't breathed rhythm so so what i did was i played piano like 80 times i took one of the the themes that i thought was correct and i started just twisting it in like each phrase has its own rhythm like like a like you're like you're playing an Ornette Coleman piece. Each but not, but each phrase would have its own rhythm, and then the breath is the most important thing, so that the dialogue would be heard and understood without without prepping, the without the music prepping the incoming dialogue. And I think it was it was an incredible, for me it was an incredible on the edge experience. I could get this 
or I could really, really, really fail. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so the first time I played it for everybody, it was like, I was literally, you know, I was so far inside myself that I probably couldn't even respond if, if somebody said anything to me, you know, uh, for a minute, you know. Is that good? Uh, yeah. What else do we Great. have? No, yeah, we have a lot of questions. So let me um, get with some of them. But first of all, I want to uh, read you uh, some comments and then we'll go uh, back to questions. So we have um, a question from uh, Robert Schneier and I hope I'm uh, pronouncing his last name well uh, correctly. He says, this film shows how a community can band together to reach out towards an individual with men mental illness. And I think this is a, a wonderful observation. Um, so I thought I should read that to you. And uh, I, we have another one from Susan Robbins who says, just loved, loved, loved the film, never saw it before. I want to watch it again. So um, she loved yeah, that. I'm curious how many of the people on tonight were just discovering the film. Uh, well, Su Susan Robbins is one of them. Um, and now I have um, a question from. Um, Amanda Nassim, and I think that this is for you, Bill. Uh, how did Greg Gillespie become attached as the director? Well, as I said, it was before I got involved. Uh, uh, he must have read the script and met with the filmmakers. And um, it was quite a funny thing. You know, he, he had just finished shooting a movie when I first met with him, and the movie was in post-production, and it was a big broad commercial comedy uh, for New Line. Uh, I think it was called Mr. Woodcock. It was Billy Bob Thornton was yeah. in it. And for whatever reason, that movie, uh, it got finished, but its release got delayed. And so it ended up with, it came out at almost the same time as Lars or within a month or something. And the critics were completely dumbfounded, like, how is it that, who is this guy, Craig Gillespie? How does he have two movies out at the same time? And how are they so radically different? And who thought that the, you know, director of Mr. Woodcock would be the right guy to direct Lars and the Real Girl? And, you know, maybe if Mr. Woodcock had already come out, uh, no knock on that movie. I mean, it was, a, a, you know, just a broad commercial studio comedy, uh, but it wouldn't have been an obvious sample of, uh, director's work uh, and and you know I thought Craig really did a, a masterful job I gotta say again uh, I think this movie is what they call in the business a small target you know uh, there's uh, you know a movie that you really have to get right in its execution and one thing I want to really uh, <clears throat> shine a light on it's a beautifully cast movie in every part beyond Ryan. And it was all Craig. These were many actors that I wasn't familiar with at the time. Um, you know, I certainly knew who Emily Mortimer was and I knew who Patty Clarkson was, but I didn't know Kelly, you know, uh, Kelly Garner's work and uh, Paul and, uh, and, you know, we were looking to put as many names as we could because we were the studio and we were financing it. And, uh, you know, Craig kept coming in with some fresh faces uh, and he was right in every choice, you know, and I think that's what allowed the movie to have that suspension of disbelief. You know, I think these actors were just all so committed and they were just playing the, the truth of it. Um, and, and it really worked as an ensemble picture. Right. Uh, absolutely. Um, I have, um, we have a what? question from, uh, um, yes, David, do you want to say something? I just want to say what a joy to write to really. I mean, I mean, really see, seeing actors and production all at this level that, that is just fine and committed really made me want to just have it be everything right. I didn't really want to, I didn't want anything that I did to be compromised uh, internally. I wanted to present it as if it were as good as the commitments that you see in Paul Schneider and Emily and Ryan and Patty. It's, it, it, it really was kind of amazing to work to, uh, a great, 
great experience for me. You know, you, when, when you're watching uh, as a musician, as a composer, when you're watching the same scenes over and over again, I think everybody does this, but that at a certain point, you not only start to pick it apart, but if you're working on something in it, you can start like, you, you can start like um, caricaturing what you're seeing. And I can't say that uh, that ever happened to me on this picture. I always felt like this was really worth it to see, to see uh, something of this level of quality with uh, an intent or a presumed intent that I could, I really could relate to. Um, so just wanted to say, sorry, Mira. No, absolutely. Um, I have so many questions though uh, for both of you. So I'm going to take one from anonymous attendee and I'm going, I think I'm going to combine what anonymous is asking and Bill, I believe it's for you. He's talking about Lars uh, and saying that Lars is never identified as on the spectrum in the movie. Can you talk more about that since you mentioned that Ryan studied persons with autism to prepare for the role? Uh, he's also uh, wondering if um, that um, character and story is based on um, a true story in, of, of some, in some way. That's for you. Uh, on uh, the writer's story? Um, <laughs> well, I know that it, you know, it, it certainly had some roots uh, in her you know, uh, lived experience. Um, and let me be clear, I, I'm not saying that Lars is someone uh, with autism or uh, it, it was never in the script, it's not in the movie. It was really only something that Ryan told me at the premiere uh, after the fact that that was one of the things that he had done in his uh, research for the movie. Um, but, you know, I, I have a son who's on the autism spectrum and I'm sure that was part of why I was attracted to this in the first place and uh, some <clears throat> part of it touched me and um, you know, some, uh, I mean, the thing about autism, everybody is so unique, but it is a characteristic that they can be either hypersensitive or hyposensitive. And I think the whole thing of Ryan's inability to touch, uh, and then the deeply moving moment when he finally takes, you know, Margot's hand, uh, and when he tells the doctor, you know, when I touch people, it's like, uh, it's like I'm being burned. Um, that wouldn't be uncharacteristic of, you know, probably a lot of uh, descriptions that you might hear uh, from among people, you know, in the autism community. Uh, but I don't think Nancy wanted to ever reduce this uh, in any way. You know, you, you get uh, explanation about his family history and his father and his brother abandoning him. And there's all kinds of clues uh, that you <clears throat> you know get but it, it's it's all non-reductive just like the movie you know will never commit or land hard on left foot or right foot and that's the beauty of it to me it it, it has an openness that lets you uh, interpret it and uh, there's so few you know certainly Hollywood movies that do that you know the whole design of the product is to be more of a closed end experience it's probably a little more typical of european you know cinema uh to embrace <clears throat> ambiguity to this degree mm. right thank you uh, i have a comment that i want to read to you uh that's from shauna ricketts and she says um i mean it's kind of an extension on what you just talked about i think um, so she said, interestingly i was just exposed to lars and the real girl when i was a freshman in college I was taking a disability in America course and my professor had the class debate the way in which communities perceive and respond to those marked as other. This movie ripples through my mind every now and again when I think about how we defined normalcy and then we re redefine it time and time again. She thanks, thank you for inspiring a sociology and political science major <laughs> who at the time did not know that they could end up as a film producer. So <laughs> that's a, a very nice comment from, um, from Shauna. And I have, um, if I can just find that question that I saw from Donna Louise Harris, 
who I believe is, um, knows David Thorne. Or David, do you know Donna? <laughs> okay, so she's, uh, Donna, she says that uh, this is from Archie. And she's asking, uh, how did you decide when there should be music where there shouldn't be, and when you decided that you should have music, how did you decide whether it should reflect or amplify the emotion of the scene, or if it should be a motif that foreshadows or connects the scene to other future or pre-established ideas? Um, it's a long question, but- Good question. Yes, yeah. a good question. Uh, I, um, uh, just so you know, I, I mentor, I have mentored Archie on a couple of films that he's composed. So, so these are good questions. Um, yeah, uh, I think that th deciding what's going to be written where is is it, it it's driven by by director, director and and film editor. Who have already been looking at the picture for a very long time at the point that I showed up, and they have already tempted music in. So they've made decisions that we talk about when we watch the film for the first time and together with notes, copious notes throughout, and and trying to come to some agreements about where music isn't working, where it need, might need to be different, where where I think maybe music should be, and we had a lot of conversations about this, as Bill mentioned earlier. Um, it was light in music, which actually made the music feel more important in the film in a certain way, very specific way, but was difficult to contend with. And I can say that I don't think, except for setting up the film at the beginning, I don't think I did any kind of foreshadowing of anything in this film ever. I do, because, because at least not not purposefully, because of of this idea that the the intent of the film w is really up to the viewer to decide what is important to them in it. And like it's it's not that it's vague; it's that it's open to the the. So, so I, I, I felt strongly that foreshadowing was really not the way to go. I didn't want to mislead anybody. I didn't want to, I didn't want to set up a comic shot. I didn't want to, you know, like I was saying about being very uh, circumspect about writing during the funeral. I had to, I just threw everything away and just went, oh, you know, open it up, rubato. Don't play that much. Don't write that much. Keep it open so that people still feel enough space in the music that they can reference what they're feeling about the film. So I think that answered most of the questions, Archie. But. <laughs> um, well, we, we, we are already um, beginning to run out of time. So I'm gonna try and, and um, squeeze in a, a few more questions. Uh, so we have a question from Facebook Live. Um, uh, from Robert uh, Schneier, and he's just asking, what town was this film um, in? That's for Bill, I guess. This was movie was shot in Toronto. Uh, it was standing in for the Midwest. Uh, it never really said exactly whether this was Wisconsin or Minnesota or, you know, but you felt it was kind of like a central Midwest, northern state even the name Lars um, but uh, for financial reasons primarily uh, it was all shot in Toronto and uh, it was shot a little bit out of season so it was actually quite an expensive investment and it was a little bit controversial but I uh, kind of convinced my bosses to support the director but all the snow in the movie was snow that we had to make and truck in and dress into all the exterior shots. Uh, so that was all movie magic. Okay. <laughs> um, I have, uh, I'm gonna just read you a couple of um, questions that maybe hopefully have short answers. Uh, from Chaz Wagner, he's, asked, he's saying it's a lovely film and he's really asking, I think it's, um, it's more for the screenwriters, but I, perhaps you would know the answer for that, Bill. Uh, how, how and who, I guess, decide on a closing night 
uh, in the closing line, so, sorry, do you want to go for a walk? This script, you know, again, unlike 99% of the movies I've worked on, it hardly changed at all from the script I read to what you saw. Uh, you know, there might have been one little polish or maybe one scene cut, you know, or something just adjusted for the reality of a location or, uh, but, you know, Craig loved the script, I loved the script, Ryan loved the script, and uh, it went through very little uh, development. And, you know, again, in Hollywood, development is often development hell, is what it's called, uh, you know, because things can get pulled apart and, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, so uh, I believe that script, that line was, you know, always the last line. It was a beautiful uh, ending for this story. Well, I mean, I think that's a perfect place to um, say thank you guys. Uh, I mean, we, we talked about the last line of the movie and I think that, um, I mean, as somebody said here and I'll just read it, she, uh, it's an, Susan and she says that uh, this is a fascinating discussion and uh, I really want to see it again. And Susan, um, you will be able to see it again. It's going to be on our homepage uh, on our website. And also it, since it's on Facebook Live, it will live there for a long time. So you can always find it on Facebook Live. Um, I, to those of you whose questions I didn't get to, I'm sorry. Um, I just don't really want to take um, a lot of time of this wonderful, um, busy gentleman and uh, uh, your, of your time. So thank you very much, David Torn. Thank you very much, Bill Horberg. You guys are fantastic and the film is incredible. Um, and uh, we will talk to you again about something else in the future, I hope. Stay healthy and stay well. Everybody, all the attendees, thank you so much. I want to tell everyone that next week we're going to have two of these actually. Bill, we're going to be talking with John Sloss. Um, on Tuesday uh, next week about so many of the films that he produced. And on Thursday, we'll be talking with uh, the, um, the editor of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisels. So- Well, Mayur, I wanna just say at the end, thank you for doing this. It's great that you're providing this programming, you know, during this uh, troubled times for people. And I think it creates a sense of community, uh, not unlike the community in the film. So thanks for having us. Thank yeah. you. I think this is a lot what the Woodstock Film Festival is about. And that brings me to the last thing I want to say is so that uh, these are very difficult times for all of us. And um, we're going to be continue to uh, create and bring to everyone um, as much wonderful material as we can. And if anybody can um, uh, go to our website and make a donation, uh, it will help us uh, do that. So um, these are hard times, I know, but um, um, we could really use that. So if you can, that would be very appreciated. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody who joined us. And uh, until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.